It is so good to be with you again. If I haven't met you, my name is Ashley. I serve as a director of discipleship here at Rinalda. And I don't want to start in a, a place that's too abrupt. Some of you, this is going to be jarring news. But I need to let you know that I think there are some women in this room who weren't born in the 1900s. <laughs> Just let that sink in for a minute. I think they're here. Which means that they probably did not grow up watching the Oprah show at 4 o'clock on ABC, okay? <laughs> They've missed an entire piece of American culture. Anybody else into Oprah back in the day? Well, oh yeah, loved it. I see those hands. I see those hands. <clears throat> Fascinating interviews. Fascinating. Unbelievable giveaways. Remember Oprah's favorite things? And of course, yeah, somebody's saying it. You get a card, you get a card, you get a card. So fun. She has an unbelievable story of overcoming odds. She was born to an unwed teenage mother in poverty, but she was a voracious learner. And teachers recognize that. And after college, she landed a job as a news reporter in Baltimore and absolutely rocked it. And before anybody knew it, she was taken over Phil Donahue on that daytime TV, <laughs> started her own Harpo Productions company. She's helped so many through philanthropy. The rest is history. Fascinating woman. Anne told me as we were talking this week about an interview that Oprah did with author Scott Peck, who wrote The Road Less Traveled. And I looked it up and uh, found the, the transcript and the interview. <clears throat> In this interview, she poses a poignant question I wanted us to spend some time on today. <clears throat> she says, that, well, they get into a conversation about him either having a muse or being inspired by God to write his book, The Road Less Traveled. And she said, and I just don't believe God cares whether you call him God or whether you call him a muse or whether you call it nature or her or whatever you call it or whether you say the universe. She goes on to say, any force that is omnipotent, that powerful, all-knowing, wouldn't get caught up in a name. <laughs> she said, that's what I feel. I was sitting in church years ago, listening to the preacher talk about the Lord, that God is a jealous God. And I thought, what's he got to be jealous of? That's a good question. And she's built an empire based on asking good questions. It's a great question. Then she said, that's when my whole concept of religion versus spirituality changed. Here it is. If the earth is the Lord's, and everything that's in it, why would he want anything else? Why is he jealous? And so to resolve the tension, Oprah determines that God is less personal, more ethereal. When the Lord made that statement in Exodus 20, to drive home the very opposite. Your God is voraciously relational. He's voraciously relational. So today we're going to talk about our God as a consuming fire, a jealous God, 
and why that is wonderful news for you and for me. So let's pray. Father, we are thankful to be in this place together, and we're thankful to come before you. We do give you honor and glory and praise as we've been doing all morning, lifting you high in this place. We sense your presence with us. And we confess, God, that we can so identify with Martha because we come in here worried and busied with many things. Many things. And so, God, we just take a moment to lay those before you, to release them. And we thank you that you are a Savior who delights in women coming to sit at your feet, to learn from you. And we receive your yoke today that is easy and your burden that is light. So would you come and instruct our hearts? God, would you open our eyes to see the wonder of your character, your person, and your pursuit of us for your glory? In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we looked at the story of Jesus' baptism in uh, Matthew. Well, it's in every gospel, but uh, today I want us to look at Matthew chapter 3. Right before Jesus is baptized, Matthew's telling us about John the Baptist. He's a strange man. (laughs) Camel hair and leather belt, eating locusts and honey. But he's baptizing, and... While he's baptizing, a group of Pharisees and Sadducees start to come around. He's not afraid. He rebukes them. But then he says this. This is Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. I baptize you with water, but he's coming and he's going to baptize you with fire. I, I mean, sometimes it's helpful to me when I'm reading the scriptures to just put myself in the people that were there in the moment. I can just imagine the eyes <laughs> widening. He's going to baptize us with What? And I can't help but think that these Jewish folks, that their minds would have gone to the stories of old that they'd heard from generation to generation about the way that God had dealt with their ancestors in the wilderness. I think they would have remembered that their forefathers had just left Egypt and crossed the Red Sea and made their way to Mount Sinai And there God began to give Moses some instruction. He said, I want you to ready the people. Cleanse them. Everybody cleans their clothes. They have three days of preparation. And I want them to come near to the mountain but not touch it. I only want you to come up. And what the people would have witnessed is something that would have blown their minds Let's look at Exodus 19, 4 to 6. This is when God is telling them what's going to happen as they draw near to Sinai. He says, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples for all the earth is mine did you catch that 
You shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is the very opposite of what Oprah said. He said, because everything is mine. That th- this makes the statement come with even more force. Anything I want is mine. It all belongs to me. I'm the author of everything you see. It all holds together, as we sang this morning, in me. And I have chosen you as my treasured possession. So the people hear that, and then they begin to see some unbelievable things happen. As Moses goes up on the mountain, a thick cloud settles on it. And on the third day, they hear thunder, and they see lightning out of this thick cloud, and they hear a trumpet blast that gets louder and louder, but they don't see any trumpet player, and they tremble. And Mount Sinai is wrapped in smoke, the scriptures say, because the Lord descended on it in fire. The Lord descends on it in fire. The people would have known this for sure. The Lord our God is holy. He is holy. He is set apart. There is none like him. He is pure. And then Moses, God calls Moses to the top of the mountain and he gives him the 10 words or the 10 commandments. The first one's very similar to the second in its nature and heart. The first one is you shall have no other gods before me. And then we come to Exodus 20 verse 4. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. See, the Israelites had come out of Egypt and all around them there were polytheistic uh, peoples who served many different gods that would be shaped into literal idols that they could see and, and bow down to. And they couldn't see this God, Yahweh. But he's saying, do not make an image to serve. You trust me. Verse 5, you shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I am Yahweh your God, and I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands who love me and keep my commandments. He says, no other gods before me, no carved image. I love the way that Tim Keller talks about idols and Obviously, we don't have carved images today that might tempt us into worship, but uh, an idol is anything in our hearts that we exalt above God himself. Any place or person or thing that we would go to to provide what only God can provide for us, where we might seek purpose or security or joy or hope, and they'll disappoint us every single time. Keller says, anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God is an idol. He says, a counterfeit God is anything so central and essential to your life that should you lose it, your life would hardly be worth living. An idol has such a controlling position in your heart that you can spend most of your passion and energy, your emotional and financial resources on it without a second thought. It can be good things, like family. And children, it could be your career in making money or achievement and, and acclaim. It could be your social standing or a certain relationship, your own competence and skill, your own comfort, your beauty, your brains, your political or social cause, your Christian ministry itself. It could be anything that you exalt above the worship of God. And it's in the context of that forbidden idolatry that God says, I am a jealous God. We see it again at the end of the Torah, Deuteronomy. This is where Moses is talking to the children of those who've wandered through the desert and aren't going to be allowed to enter the promised land due to their disobedience. And he's reiterating all of what God has told them to these children. And he's saying, do not worship idols. Listen to me. Worship God alone. 
And in Deuteronomy 4.24, he says, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire. He's a jealous God. He's trying to get them to have the sense in their heart of what their parents did at the, Mount, at the bottom of Mount Sinai, where they saw the fire, and the voice of God said himself, I'm a jealous God. No other idols before me. And so here we are again, this strange, little, slightly disturbing phrase. Why do we have a God who is jealous? I was talking to a woman recently, and she was expressing some concern about her husband and a relationship that he has at work with a coworker. And she was saying that he mentions her often, and that he'd mentioned that she'd brought him lunch before and that they'd, the other night they were on the phone for a long time. And then she said, I mean, I'm not like a jealous woman or anything. I said, I am. <laughs> what do you mean you're not a jealous woman? You are married to him. You are married to him. I am 100% jealous for my husband. 100%. I am not okay with any hint of a woman coming toward him in an inappropriate manner. I remember when, you know, I've had a ring on longer than he has, obviously, because he proposed five months before we got married, and I started to get used. To, I mean, I did almost wreck the car a few times, you know, while you got your hand on the wheel. You're like, oh! But then I remember our wedding day, and soon after that, I was so enamored with the look of a ring on Barrett's finger, because I was like, yes, and you will not take it off. You will not. You will not, because that declares to the world, he is taken. Amen. My husband is handsome, okay? He is taken. He's taken. And no one would say there's a problem with me being a jealous wife in that sense. Something would be wrong with my love if I was okay with other women impinging on our relationship. This word for jealous that we see in Exodus 20 and in Deuteronomy 4, in the Hebrew, it's only used along with God. It's not jealous in the sense that humans are jealous. It's not, it has no hint of envy or evil with it. The earth is the Lord's and all that it contains. It has the sense of a protective love, a zealous love. And that's who God says he is. You will have no idols before you because I am zealous for you to have all of you because I've given you all of me. You're my treasured possession. He's jealous because he's in a covenant relationship with us. And as the most valuable being in the universe, it would be unleaving if he let us settle for anything less. I have shared some quotes from this book with you before, uh, but I'm going to share a different part of it today. This is Jackie Hill Perry's book, Holier Than Thou. And in describing God's character, she says this, she says, it is his very nature to be righteous, as in right, as in conforming to a set standard of morality, the standard being himself. We are only good insofar as we are like God. So then any attempt to be holy is an attempt to be like God. Simply put, the two are inseparable. Holiness and God's being, that is. You cannot 
separate them. So a holy, righteous God can only want good things for us because there is no hint of perversion or evil in his heart for us. So his jealousy for our undivided heart, for our wholehearted affection back toward him is the absolute most loving posture that he could take toward us. I love that God doesn't call you to something that he isn't first. First Peter, when he's commanding the people in how to conduct themselves as strangers and aliens in this world, he says, be holy as the Lord is holy. He recalls God's word out of Leviticus 11. Be holy as I am holy. Holiness and God's being are inseparable. And Jackie Hill Perry is establishing this truth about God's character. But also, if you flip that statement on its head or look at it from the other side, I've been thinking about how there's no holiness apart from God's being. You cannot work your way into holiness in any way, shape, or form. And the Lord knows that. That's why he prophesied in Isaiah, or Ezekiel 36. He says, there's a day coming. There's a day coming when I am going to pour out my spirit on your sons and your daughters. My spirit is going to fill you and enable you to obey my law. I'm going to cleanse you, and then you'll be clean. You'll be able to walk in my statutes. So he doesn't just call you to live a holy life. He fills you with his very holy being in the spirit that you might honor him, that you might be set apart for his purposes. He fills you with himself. He fills you with himself. One thing that's well known about fire is that it is a purifying source. When, when medical workers want to refine gold or silver, they take the metal and they subject it to unbelievably high temperatures. And as they do so, the impurities in the metal begin to separate from the core purity of gold and silver. And what's left on the top is called dross. And they're able to skin it Skim it, excuse me, skim it off the top, leaving pure metal. And they repeat this process over and over and over again until the metal is pure. Malachi 3, he, God prophesied that he would do this for us. He says, I'm going to send my messenger, and he's going to be like the refiner's fire and he will purify the sons of Levi like gold and silver. And then righteousness is what's going to be left. That is going to be the result. I thought about the John Mark McMillan song when I was meditating on this. He is jealous for me. It's a different metaphor, but same kind of message. He loves like a hurricane, and I'm a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and his mercy. He's jealous for you, and he's filled you with the fire of the Holy Spirit to purify and set you apart that you would not worship another. So back to Matthew 3. There's some debate about exactly who John is talking to in this passage. Remember he said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but there's one coming after me and he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He goes on to say his winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And so people debate, is he talking about fire of judgment here, or is he talking about fire of purification to believers? And I think the answer is yes. <laughs> yes.
because Jesus satisfied the wrath of God on our behalf, when he fills you with the fire of the Holy Spirit, his fire purifies you. But there will be a day when every knee will bow to Jesus in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And for those who have not trusted in him for salvation, the wicked will be consumed by the fire of his wrath. You have no need to be afraid of that day, though, if you're in Christ. So John the Baptist's word has come to pass. The Lord has baptized you in Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He's burning away the dross and giving you the power to live a life that's absolutely set apart for his glory. So I would just encourage you, if you feel like you are experiencing the refiner's fire, he's inviting you into loosening your grip on worldly affections. Would you receive that as a mark of God's voracious love for you? He's coming after you. He will not share you with another. You are his treasured possession, and he has redeemed you that you might be a priest and part of a holy nation. Lean into it. Ask God for more that you might worship him and him alone. Amen.